Welcome to the Startup Grind. Okay, so I believe before I start, I, uh, I'm going to do a shout out to our sponsors here, uh, Telecom and uh, Decent. And I would like to welcome you all to uh, Magio Plus and our Allot Startup Grind, which we're hosting here. Welcome. Today I am interviewing the uh, fantastic Tanya. Ciao, Tay. And with that, I think we will get started. And uh, yeah, we have Slido in the background here. You should be able to see the hashtag there. For those of you who, uh, ah, we have some Slido representatives here even. <laughs> uh, do feel free to ask us questions. I'm going to put aside roughly about 15 minutes towards the end where you can uh, throw it out and ask any questions to us. And uh, we'll do our best to answer all of them. And all right, let's have a seat and get started. Thank you. Very motivational music behind me. All right, so I think we'll start it off. Why don't you tell us where you came from? The Cent very beginning. The very beginning. Well, I came from central Slovakia, the small village called Hontianske Nemce, uh, where my parents still live, and I uh, usually go and visit them. I uh, went there for a grammar school and basic school. And then I uh, went for a gymnasium to Banska Bystrica for four years. Well, actually, that was just uh, two and a half years because uh, then I started to dance ballroom dances and I wanted to win. And there was a club in Banska Bystrica which didn't have that good trainers. So I somehow made myself to come to Bratislava for the rest uh, one and a half year to study here and to dance here. Well, ballroom dance. How did you get into ballroom dancing? Well, I was, I was a small girl like every girl is and uh, the times when I was a small girl usually girls wanted to be uh, dancers, singers, actresses or um, let's say uh, stewardess. That was, the, that was the dream for the girls uh, my age when I was young. I know it's changed a lot now. Now every girl wants to be entrepreneur or, or being in the business or scientist or something but uh, when I was young that was a little bit different. Wow and so, so jumping back here your parents, what, what do they do? My mom is a teacher at the basic school. She teaches Slovak language and uh, history, and father is uh, wet, so he's taking care about the uh, dogs and uh, cats and the animals. Wow, and did, did, was your mother your, your teacher when you went to uh, primary school? Unfortunately, she was for, uh, for a little bit and for a little while, but uh, thanks God just for a little while because uh, it was very tough. Uh, I was a child of a teacher, so it immediately puts you in a position where you have a little bit of protect. Um, I mean, you, you are treated a different way, like everyone see you, like uh, you have uh, different privileges, and it's not true. Usually, when you have to stand up in front of the blackboard and to answer to some questions of a teacher, you need to know much more than the others to gain the best mark. So you learn how to tackle being embarrassed from a very young age, I take it. Well, I guess I had to. I mean, my mom, she would say a lot of stories about me when I was a really young child. When I was, um, I don't know, I was the first grade, so about the six years. I was so bored at home and I knew where my parents had hidden the money. So I came there, I took the money, I bought the ticket for the bus. I sat on the bus and I went to visit my aunt which was the next village, but I was so bored at home and there was no mobile phones that time. They just found out 7 p.m. She's not home where she is. So they were quite scared, but then actually they found out that, okay, I'm probably by my auntie. So, so I, was, I was really stubborn and, uh, and really bad child. Yeah, quite a rebel from the, uh, from the early age. So jumping forward again, what was the transition from ballroom dancing to entrepreneurship? Um, so after the Velvet Revolution came, uh, it was quite difficult with the money in my, in my family. So uh, I was really trying to do these ballroom dances because I loved it. That, that took me like for, uh, for three years, I was doing almost nothing. I was not really going to school. I was dancing all the day. I had an individual studio plan. So I was really dancing all the day. I was not going to school. And uh, after I finished this, uh, this gymnasium here in Bratislava, I, uh, I had to make my decision. 
because uh, the ballroom dancing became so expensive that my parents couldn't support anymore, especially because we were like a quite good couple, so we were going internationally for the for the competitions, but it was not possible to support it anymore. It was really, really extremely expensive. And uh, so I had to make a decision what I'm going to do. And the decision was, okay, I'm going to start to work because I wanted to make the money. I didn't want to be dependent on anyone. So first of all, I started to work. I had some, some two jobs. And then my third job was a uh, travel agency. Okay. And in this travel agency, there was a boss who took all the, all the employees, like the numbers. And uh, he was quite bossy. And when he made a mistake, he couldn't really say, okay, I made a mistake, I'm sorry. He was trying to push this mistake to you and make you to feel sorry for that mistake he made. And it made me really angry all the time. So one day I just decided, okay, I'm gonna leave. And if he can do it this way, I'm gonna do it better. That's good learning. What were the, what were the other two jobs you had before the uh, travel agency? So my first job really after the grammar school was uh, an assistant for the company which is now uh, Sony in Trnava, before it was uh, called Sony Avex. Okay. And they were doing um, this, um, these things which are, which are going into the um, TVs, this, this green thing, how is it called in English? I, I don't know. The green, thing. the green thing, you have these small pieces on it, you know, you have to put it there and then you put it in. Okay, whatever. So they were doing something technical. And uh, I was doing an assistant of the director, and uh, that was really, really funny because when I came there, they had um, they had these people from Germany, from Sony, controlling the quality, and they needed someone who speaks German and English, and I did speak both languages that time uh, because the director didn't speak very well English and he didn't speak very well German, so he needed someone who could translate uh, from these German people to him, and that was supposed to be me. And actually, when I came uh, into that company as an assistant, he found out that uh, I can work with his computer. It was really very old Pentium, but he couldn't even turn it on, not to use it. So he put me to sit in his chair in front of his table to play with that uh, computer. And I was doing the reports for um, for Japan and, and, and Germany, and I don't know who else with these with these German German managers from Sony. But it took me like uh, three months, and then I just really got bored. So after three months, I said, okay, I'm going. And I started to work for the um, uh, au pair agency. And then I was working for one and a half year. And then the boss who was there, he was actually learning on me how to manage the people. I was really first employee. And uh, it was quite rough some days because he was screaming on me for something. I, I, I was, I was, it was not my mistake. And then again, it, it took me like one and a half year, and then I said I cannot work with him anymore, and then and, and I just left. And then there was this uh, coincidence that I knew someone uh, uh, who started the travel agency for the young people. It's called CKM 2000 Travel, and I started to work there. And I really fell in love with the job. Just this boss was <laughs> really bossy. Wow, yeah, I'm, I'm sure. There's more people here who have had problems with uh, uncomfortable bosses in their future at one time or another. Uh, how would you say that impacted you for when you yourself became a boss later on? Did you take a lot of learnings from this? I hope so. There is a couple of people from Pelican here, I see, so they can maybe say really. <laughs> yeah, just do, the, do that on Slido afterwards. We'll cover it nicely. It's good. So I hope I, I did take some learning from that. <laughs> That's cool. So... After you've done the traveling agency, then you started transitioning into a more entrepreneurial mindset? I guess, yes, but I think I was always uh, this kind of person who was stubborn, and if I just decided I want this, I went for it, and I didn't look left or right. I mean, this was the goal, and I said I wanted. I was not really looking, okay, if it doesn't work, then maybe I'll do this, and maybe I'll do that. That was never in my mind. In my mind, there was always a setup. I want this, I'm going to get it. However, I'm just gonna get it. So, um, so I think that was uh, that was also for for my beginning, when uh, when I started uh, this this business. That was something I really fell in love with. This this air tickets and, and and traveling and everything. That was everything connected together. Geography, uh, IT, computers. Uh, I don't know travel business. So uh, so that's what I really fell in love and I started to do it. I had I mean. I never had some doubts that I cannot make it. Nice. So we often say that 
the greatest entrepreneur, entrepreneur, no, entrepreneurial endeavors uh, are born out of problems. And so my question is, when you decided to start Pelican, was there a problem you saw that you wanted to solve? Well, there was a lot of problems I want to solve. But there was one, one main problem, because when I had my, my travel agency, um, I had, let's say, two or three employees. It was a very small one, but still doing very well. And uh, then the September 11 came. Then after that, the low costs came into the market before there were no low costs. And the airlines, they were paying to travel agents uh, usually quite nice commission from selling air tickets. And uh, also the prices were much higher. So let's say that time, uh, the businessman, when he wants to fly to London, uh, he would have to pay for the flight uh, going to London on Monday and going back on Tuesday evening, let's say at least 1,500 euros. That was the price. And we've got a commission, yes, from that. Like, I don't know, 12%. Right now, you pay for the tickets, sometimes three euros. And, and that's it. Never mind whether you're a businessman or you're a student, yes? So, so actually, my, uh, my cost after all this, uh, uh, what happened, uh, cost went up. And, uh, and the margin and everything uh, came, 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 was going really, really down. So I was standing in, in, the, uh, in front of the decision what I'm going to do. Like, am I going to close the business or am I going to find out uh, some solution? And of course, the biggest problem was that uh, if one employee was bringing me, let's say, I don't know, 100,000 euros turnover per month, now I needed five employees to bring that turnover. So it was a really, really bad situation. And then I was thinking, okay, I need to find a way how to serve many clients and, uh, and do not need that many people because the people means a lot of costs. And of course, internet was the, was the solution. I was that time really very much uh, sitting in front of inter internet and, and looking uh, what's, happening, uh, what's happening in abroad, what's happening in Western countries, what's happening in the United States. And I saw all these OTAs, online travel agencies, growing and, and, and booming. And I was like, okay, I'm going to try it. So, I mean, that, that was the, that was actually, actually, internet was the solution to all my problems because otherwise I would have to close the business. Wow. So... Let's talk about the birth of Pelican then. So you started Pelican in 2004. Yeah. You were not alone. No, I was not alone. And um, after I was seeing that uh, I have this problem in the travel agency, I was really thinking what I'm going to do. And OK, the internet, that was the idea, yes. Which, and, 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 the, and the engine for, for online, that was the idea how to solve my problem. But uh, still, OK, I had some money. The last money still were there. But then I was thinking, okay, I'm going to put this money into buying some, uh, some engine because it was very, very costly that time. And what I'm going to do then? And then I understood that, okay, if I want to be on the internet, I really need to know how the marketing on the internet works. And I didn't know anything about that. All my clients were word of mouth. So they were happy with the services we provided, so they came in. But on the internet, it doesn't work like that. You really need to make a lot of attention to the people. So, and I was talking about this to my one very good friend. And he said, OK, so let's do it together. I have one more guy. And that's how we met. So we are actually three guys. But two of them, we are still really like every day working in the Pelican. And one is not, uh, not working every day anymore with us. OK, so let's talk a bit about, because most startups face the stage in the beginning where you have to decide who are you going to start the company with. And the process of starting a company with somebody, it's very intimate. You are, by definition, entering into a very solid relationship where everything relies on this relationship working out. And you see a lot of startups and entrepreneurs, things go south because the founders can't work, to work together or they find out after a while that things aren't working out between them. Let's hear a bit about your story there. Because from my understanding, it wasn't always the smoothest of rides. Well, of course it wasn't. Well, it was everything great when we were so enthusiastic when we started and we saw the first booking coming. Yes, that was great. But then we had to hire more people and we had to decide who is going to be the boss because you cannot really have two bosses. I mean, it's like uh, that's maybe a stupid... Um, uh, uh, stupid thing, but I mean, you have a dog, and if you have two guys who are screaming on the dog, one sit and the other one lie, so the dog doesn't know what to do. So I don't want to think that you 
I don't, I don't want to that you think that I think that my employees are the dogs who needs one boss, but, uh, but still it's like you need to have one boss who is setting up the priorities. And then it's very, always very difficult because you have three really enthusiastic people or more or whoever, and then when, they, when, when you start to see the money coming in, you know, everyone wants to be the one who is deciding, who is, who is having different, uh, different point of view. And we three were all so different that at the beginning it was really, really difficult to find a way how to talk together because, uh, for example, with the organization structure, that was just one example. Uh, there was there was one of us who was saying we have to make a linear infra, uh, linear, linear organization structure. I was like, how do you want to make a linear organization structure? I mean, you want 20 people to be deciding about everything. Who is going to approve the uh, holidays? I mean, that has to be one person who knows who is going to uh, decide on the priorities for the people at marketing, who is going to decide on the priorities in the call center, what's going to be made. I mean, you cannot really come to one person and tell him that um, you are going to do now this, and then the second one comes from the other way and tell you are going to do that, and then that, that, that employee is going to, okay, so what I have to do now? Who is the bigger boss? You know, so... That were, that were the first things, and, and really had a tough time to uh, to decide who's going to do what, and and then the others come and, and and still coming. So I mean, it is really difficult to pick up the people for the beginning, and uh, always when you start, you have to think on that that the people changes during the time. They they do not stay the same way. You met them and you had a great fun with them uh, when you had a drink uh, in the evening and you came with a great idea and you decided, okay, we're gonna do it. Yes, yeah, so that's that's the beginning. But you have to be really very careful who are you going to break with because uh, because people changes. They they have different opinions and you have to find a way how to how to talk together and not to not to kill the company from the beginning by by quarreling. Yeah, because how old were you guys when you when you first met? Uh, we were all around 24, 25. Okay, so you still had quite a bit of growth to go through before you uh, found yes. out who you really were. Yes. Well, so talk about some of the... Uh, let's, let's actually start. What were some of the mistakes you made early on? Well, there were, there were really, really many mistakes, but... Um, but uh, maybe those I did uh, came from my uh, character because I'm really very stubborn. And maybe sometimes I could bite my tongue and be quiet, but I'm quite open person, so sometimes I, and sometimes I, I usually speak very openly. And uh, there were several mistakes I, I made. Even if we talk about, uh, about the business, then, then, then later, I mean, we invested money into the product we were not ready for and, and, and we lost a lot of money. And uh, I mean, also with the, with the talks and negotiations with some, uh, um, some really big corporations, which are now our suppliers, we, we, were, not, uh, uh, we were not experienced enough to, to do these negotiations about the big contracts. So we, we forgot one small clause and, and then we lost a lot of money because then they came, eh, you don't have it there. And I was like, okay, cool. So yeah, we made a lot of mistakes and we're still doing some mistakes. But the most important thing is that we learn from that mistakes and uh, we never give up. So I think that's, that's very important because you will do mistakes if you are doing something. If you are not doing anything, then okay, you can be happy you're not going to do mistakes. But if, if you really work, then you're going to make mistakes and you have to be ready for that. Yeah, so returning back to the, uh, to the founding team, maybe you can describe the three different personalities that uh, were there. Okay. You're, you're, the, you're, the, you're the stubborn one. I'm the stubborn one. Well, I think every one everyone of us was stubborn. Enough. That's usually the problem with the people who, who are good leaders. They usually are stubborn and they need to be stubborn to make things move, I think. So, uh, so all three of us, we were stubborn, but we were very different personalities. For example, uh, Ivan, he was very much a chatty person. He loved to go out and drink with people and discuss and talk to the journalists and, uh, you know, and, and bringing the information. And then Patrick, he was he was quite a geek, so he really loved to sit in front of the computers and, and read a lot. He was he was usually sleeping four hours a day, you know. He always uh, was working until 4 a.m. and and reading everything and coming with new ideas. And I was the one who was uh, who was working actually. 
and uh, making things happen <laughs> with the people. So that was that was big difference, and it meant that every one of us has a little bit different point of view and uh, view on the things. Yeah, because Ivan he tells that everything could be done like this. Patrick he tells that this is great technology. Let's do it. Let's do it. We we'll, we are going to do it. And I was like, okay, guys. Now I need people who are going to do it. Now I need money to buy that technology, and I need this and this and this to make it alive, you know, and to bring it into the life. So I was always the one, like you call it, uh, uh, how do you call it, break. I was, I was, I was a little bit of break, and and it was really difficult because uh, they sometimes didn't understand that uh, it's not that easy to bring something in life. Because it's really great to have an idea, and there is a plenty of people having great ideas, but it's not that easy to bring them into life. Okay, so you you were so you had Ivan, who was a bit of a visionary, and then Patrick, Let's say who that, was, yeah. <laughs> and Patrick, who, like you said, a geek, but he knew the technical side and was able to uh, yes. figure out the best course of action to take there. So you were the leader. I was the man who was working. <laughs> That's what I would say. <laughs> so you were getting everything done. So what happened from there on? I mean, you guys managed to find somehow the secret sauce between the three of you to actually realize and make Pelican become something. So I what was that secret sauce? I have no idea. I really have no idea. I've, I've been never thinking about that. Uh, for me... The most important thing is that I every day when I wake up, I know I'm going to do something I really love to do. Okay, sometimes I have to do something I really hate to do, like firing people when they are not doing what I have to do. But, uh, but usually my job is my hobby. And I think that's really important for everyone who wants to start a business or uh, even for the people, they, they go every day to work and they are not uh, the owners. But I think that's the most important because it helps you to go through the things which you don't like to do and through the situation which happens because they will happen. Even the bad situation, they will come. It will never be like going through the pink garden like or, or the garden full of roses, yes. So so you always uh, will, will have a really tough day and, and someone from outside comes and tells you bad, uh, bad news and you have to deal with it. So it really is important that you love the job you're doing. You love to work with the people. If you are the manager, if you have to be the leader, then you have to love it even more. So I think that's the most important things, and that's what I what what kept us together. Wow. Now, one of the most difficult things for entrepreneurs who have had successful startups and, and who are working there, sometimes the hardest thing to do is to let go, or to let other people steer the ship onwards. Can you maybe talk about? Yes, sure. How that we happened? can. Yes, sure. We can. Yes, that's uh, that's actually correct because. I have to say that, and very openly, that with Patrick, uh, I think he always had this, this, this feeling that uh, he's behind me. And I was always in the front. And I was trying to tell him that, okay, you go now and talk to journalists. You go now and make a speech. But he was always, no, no, I don't want. But then I still felt that he wanted to be the one who is making more decisions than me. And I have to say that it came a time when I was really, really tired of the business. And I had to do something about it. So actually, I took one and a half or two years uh, when I was not really going into the office at all. I was going maybe for two hours a day and sometimes not at all. I said that I really need this break. And uh, that time I gave the wheel to Patrick. And he was leading the company for two years. And I think then he realized everything I was ever telling him that this you're doing wrong, that you're doing wrong that he was really doing that wrong and he 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 really started to think a little bit different way so so i mean you have to be able to do it and sometimes for saving the company you have to be able to give the will to someone else i mean i would love to do it if there would be some really really young smart clever boy and girl who would come and I would see that they can lead the company much better than me, I would go. I already proved everything to myself. So I would really give it to to, to maybe younger people with new ideas and, and, and different ideas how to lead the company. 
I would I would do it. I think you have to you really have to learn in during the during the company growth because even in the Pelican uh, when we started, okay, that was maybe me and the Patrick who was leading the people and working with the people and telling them you are going now do this and that and now this and that. And uh, now we have really smart people in the company and uh, we're trying to learn how to let them to make the changes in the company, not us. And I think that's very important in some stage of the company that the owners finally stop uh, trying to push people to do what they want, but try to make a platform platform for them and try to uh, try to give them much more uh, much more power to decide about what is going on with the company in the next years. Okay, you hear that, people? Applications are being accepted, so you know you know where to send them. Uh, so let's talk a bit about some of the changes that Pelican have done over the years, because I'm assuming it's not the same company as when you started it. No, it's not. <laughs> so let's talk about some of the pivotal changes that have happened inside the company. What are, if you compare Pelican today to what it was what, 13 years ago since you started it, what are the biggest changes that have happened since then? I think that the biggest and really, really biggest change what happened uh, is that we are now hiring and, and, and employing uh, much smarter and much more senior people and we are looking for much more senior people into the company. Okay. Especially because really the company is coming to such a, such a stage where it's just not possible that me and Patrick are going to manage it. We need to make, let's say, three steps uh, up, and we will never be do it, uh, never be able to do it just by two of us. So I think that's the biggest change. Um, five years ago, we couldn't really imagine that we would have a CFO and to pay him as much as we pay him right now, really honestly. And uh, we couldn't really imagine that, for example, we would have our own IT team and to pay to that IT guys as much as we pay them. And um, well, but that, that's what we couldn't really imagine. So I think that's the, that's the biggest change. And also, as I mentioned before, uh, the changes that we are really, really trying to learn, and it's very difficult uh, to let people do uh, their ideas in the company and not to push them to do what we want to. I think that's the really biggest change. So that was actually going to be my, uh, my follow-up here. How do you promote innovation inside your company now? Because you said you... I mean, obviously, you need creative people to come up with new ideas and new ways to tackle both competition and, and the direction of the company. How do you promote that internally? Well, I would say that uh, there is a lot of things we are not really doing good in our company. And uh, this is one which we are not really doing the best way, and we are trying to change it. But uh, I have to say that it's uh, not easy. And uh, this, this change with these smart and senior people, it happened two and a half year ago. So we didn't know what we are going to step into. We just knew that we really need these more senior people. So we started to look for them and slowly to hire them. And now we feel that, first of all, these people, they need somehow to exchange the information in between them. And we're trying to find a way how to do it. Because also they are a little bit stubborn. There are some information they know they have to share, some information they don't know that they have to share. And uh, it's really difficult. So we are really talking a lot together these days. Maybe there's a little bit of nervosity in our company, but I'm sure we will go through it. It just will take a little bit more time, maybe a couple of two or three more months, and then we find a way which will be the best for us to exchange all this information. But, you know, these people, and I like it because these people are really making the pressure in the, pressure in the company to change this uh, internal communication and, and, and the channels and the way how we are going to communicate uh, all these technological changes and, and every change we're doing in the company. So, how many people are working at Pelican now? So, it's going to be like 150-something plus minus. Wow. Now, you originally started, you, you've always been based here in Bratislava. Yes. But now Pelican is operating in, in how many countries? In, in five or six countries? Yes. How did that, how did you move from, or how did you expand your business from Slovakia to abroad? Because a lot of Slovak businesses struggle a bit with that, with expo expanding, well, expanding the Czech Republic is usually the first step and not always the hardest one to do. Yes. But then how do you go further away? How do you breach further cultures? So with the uh, internet business and uh, virtual things which you try to uh, sell, 
uh, it's quite easy. It's not that difficult. It's much more difficult when you have a warehouse and you have some products which you need to deliver physically. So, uh, so I mean, with us it was not that difficult. And yes, the Czech Republic was the second one. We did immediately 2006. Yes, yeah, so after one year we were like, we are going to grow. It's good. It's happening here in Slovakia. So it's going to happen in Czech Republic. Funny enough, it was not that easy. And 2007 we started Hungary. And we were much more successful in Hungary than in the Czech Republic, by the way, yes. Why? Well, uh, in Czech Republic there was much more competition. Okay. And, uh, well, if we wanted to uh, make it happen in Czech Republic, we would have to invest much more money into the marketing. Because there were two companies which were really, really strong in travel business. And they were investing a lot of money into the marketing. We didn't have that money. We never had any investor. We are only working from the money we have. Uh, which we make actually, so uh, so that was really difficult there. But in Hungary, there was there was almost no competition, so we were growing much more there. But the Czech Republic is now, of course, much better. Well, so which markets that you're currently in are you uh, are you the leader in? Well, the leader definitely we are in Slovakia. We are uh, one of uh, three leaders uh, in uh, Hungary. Uh, one of one of two in Hungary number one and number two, and then we are in the first five in uh, Czech Republic. And if it comes to OTA business, like online travel agency in Poland, we are somewhere in the first three or four. Okay. And you're also in Austria, right? We're in Austria, but we're very small in Austria. Yeah, because I can imagine penetrating the German market is a little more challenging. Yes, it is, a, it is quite more challenging, I would say. When did you move into Austria? Oh my gosh, now I don't remember the year, but I think it was like, six or seven years ago. Okay. Again, it's not that difficult to translate the, uh, the website into the languages and then to buy some domain and, and, and start it there. Yeah, it's, it's not that difficult. The difficult is really to really become some number on that market. That is difficult. And, and you have to use different way of doing it on each market. Because even if we are neighbors, we are so different and the markets are so different. So. So maybe talk a bit about that process when you first went into, uh, let's not do Czech Republic because it's, I think, too similar to Slovakia, but let's talk a bit about Hungary. Uh, when you jumped into, uh, into Hungary, what was that process that you went through? And what were the challenges? Well, the language, definitely language barrier is the biggest challenge for us because I do not speak any Hungarian and uh, no, one us, uh, no one from us did. So we hired a guy who translated uh, the website and who was doing uh, such a, let's say, sales. We even uh, rented a flat for him in Budapest and let him, uh, let him stay there uh, a couple of days during the, during the month. So he go there and meet some people. So that's how we started, and, and we, of course, uh, had quite a problem to hire German-speaking people in, uh, uh, for our call center. Okay. So we got one girl from Budapest, she moved into the Slovakia, we managed her to, to move in here. But she, of course, became unhappy after one year, because she didn't have friends here, even we tried very hard. It's still, she didn't feel like home, so it was difficult. But then we started to look more for the Slovak uh, people speaking very well Hungarian, and then we managed. But uh, the biggest challenge was the language barrier. And we really had to make sure that we have a good person who speaks perfect, perfect Hungarian, who understands the Hungarian market. And that was really fun because uh, we thought that there shouldn't be a problem, the, the same process to put on that market. And funny enough, the small thing, which was uh, inserting the names uh, of the passenger on our website, caused such problems because they first always write a surname and then the first name. And even we have a reason there that this is the first name and this is the surname, they always did it the wrong way. And that was really, really uh, bad because uh, immediately after you pay for the ticket and the ticket is issued, yeah. you cannot really change it, yes? So you can change it uh, if you do it the same day, but they usually call us um, in two or three days that they want to change it and we couldn't change it. And there was a lot of money they had to pay and they were so angry with us. And we had, we had no idea that it could be such a big problem. And also the date of birth, they, they write from the, from the back. We so, so really had to change it for them. We told that we don't have to, we are going to make one web page and it's going to look the same way everywhere, but we really had to, really had to do a little bit changes for the markets. Wow, it's, it's funny how the little things sometimes come back to bite you. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
so let's uh, let's jump, take another time jump here, and because you mentioned money and funding and investors, mm -hmm. and you said you never took any. Mm -hmm. So when you started Pelican, how did that look money-wise? Because like you said, you don't come from a lot of money, so I'm going to assume your parents probably didn't fund the uh, the opening part of this company. So what happened? Did you ask for money? Did you go to investors? No, there were no, there were no, there were no investors that time. I would, uh, I would start with my travel agency, which I, which I started before the Pelican, because that was the time I really didn't have any money. I had like uh, 20 Slovak crowns, which is less than one euro for one week, and I was going to the supermarket and thinking, okay, which kind of bread am I gonna buy? Because I have this one euro for one week and I have to survive from that. I was really ashamed to come to my parents and to ask for the money because I know they didn't have. And it was really, really difficult. But I had uh, one friend, a very good friend, uh, whose father, uh, he was already in the business. And I came to him and I asked for the office for one month, just for one month, the office, the internet and the phone. And I promise I'm gonna pay after the first month. So he said, okay. He gave me this office, he gave me a computer, he gave me a telephone and the internet. And that's how I started really to make the money. So I'm really thankful to that guy. And uh, after the first month, I was able to pay my small rent. And so that's how the business started. I was going to ask my friends, which I knew they had money. So could you please borrow me like 1,000 euro that time? It was like 30,000 Slovak crowns. And I said, no, I'm not going to borrow you anything. You don't have any money, you're never going to pay back. I was like, okay, so I was, I was really lucky. So that's how I started, and uh, I think it was growing quite nice because I could manage to pay, uh, pay uh, all my rent and all my costs which I had. And then uh, when we started Pelican, I had some money from, from this travel agency, so I actually used all my last money for buying the online aging, like a box software which we bought at the beginning, but after one, after half a year, we found out that it's not enough and we had to start the development again from the scratch with someone. But I would go back at the beginning uh, because uh, when we started in 2004 and even when I started, uh, when I was 20 years old, it was really difficult because no bank would ever borrow you money. No one. And um, so it really changes a lot. For how, now. how many banks did you ask for money? two or three, <laughs> and they sent me away immediately. Like, they shut the door in front of my eyes, like, go away, in front of my nose, go away. And uh, funny enough, uh, I was already making the money in, uh, in that uh, small company, small travel agency I had, and I was trying to do uh, this kind of business for work and travel. And uh, there was a lot of students, they were going to the United States and they flew to New York, then they had an orientation in New York and then from New York they had to go to some other place. And the tickets for them, they were very expensive. So I found out, okay, there is a Greyhound. So I was trying to contact the Greyhound and I was trying to make uh, some, some contact with them in the United States. And I made a special agreement with them that uh, I'm gonna send them the orders, I'm gonna pay them by my card and they are going to send me the tickets. And if I made it this in advance, like no student had a payment card or debit card or credit card. That time, no one had a card. And uh, so when I did this in advance for them, they saved a lot of money. They could save like 20 to $25 when it was made in advance and I could still make my $10 on it. So, but the problem was that I only had this card in uh, Slovak crowns and I had to pay in United States dollars. So, and I knew that this bank I had an account with, and they knew me already for two, three years. I was paying all my debts and everything. And uh, I came to them because I knew they had American Express card. And I asked them for the American Express card because that would be issued in United States dollars. So I would save again a lot of money on the currency conversion. So I came there to the director of, the, of that bank and I asked him for the American Express card and he was like, we're not going to give you any American Express card. We're picking the people who we are going to give it. Do you have $25,000 on your account? No, you don't, so you're not gonna get it. I was like, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> so I ended up still using this my, this my card. And after we started Pelican, and there was a lot of bus and, and, and some interviews with me in the newspapers, they invited me, this bank invited me for the, for the business breakfast. So I came for the business breakfast. And actually, this uh, director, he came to me, shake my hand. Mrs. Kisilova, it's so, such a pleasure to meet you. I'm so happy you are our client. And I was like, but we know each other. 
He looked at me, he didn't understand at all. So it was really, really funny. I had a lot of stories like this. It was really difficult that time. I mean, you young people who are starting the business now, you have really such an opportunity right now. What, what would I do to have them my time? Yeah, let's, let's touch upon that. Because 13 years ago, I guess the entrepreneurial uh, ecosystem here in, uh, in Slovakia and Bratislava probably looked a little bit different than what it does today. Uh, it has matured somewhat in the last uh, 13 years. Yeah, it, it did. Obviously, there's now money to be found. Banks, of course, is one thing, but you also have VCs and other investments and even grants that are opportune. Yes, it changes a lot, I have to say. And, and, and still, again, I would be able to tell you that many stories when we started, like I told you about this bank, so many. Right now, it's such a difference. I see so many, uh, so many companies and, and, and angels and, and, and venture capitalists and, and just so many support for the, for the people they want to start the business, which is, on one hand, great. On the other hand, I have to say that uh, sometimes it bothers me when I hear the startup because uh, maybe I'm a little bit jealous <laughs> that I didn't have this opportunity when I was that time. But, uh, okay, I see on a lot of people, they, they come, they say, I have a startup, I'm, I'm going to start a big business. And, and they come, they, they, get the mo- they, they, uh, they get the money. And then after one year, you don't hear about them because it finishes. And I always think that when you work hard and you gain something after this hard work, you value it much more than when you just get it. And usually when, you just, usually when you just get the money from the bank, it's so easy to spend them. It's really, really easy to spend them because it's not your money and you don't have to pay back. Well, sometimes you do have to, but sometimes you don't because venture capitalists and angels, when they give you the money, it's just so easy to spend those money and very quick. So I think it's always better to take a little bit, make it so you can pay it back, and then take again and again. But to take a lot of money from the beginning and then to spend it, it's, it's so easy, and I think it's not good. Yeah. But let's go into details about how you've seen the, uh, the Slovak ecosystem change over the years. So obviously access to money is, is a big difference, uh, both through the EU and the local, uh, local uh, government as well. Uh, but what about the the mentality? How many people back when you were 20 did you meet that said, "I want to be an entrepreneur"? Because <laughs> now today it's it's become quite sexy to be an entrepreneur. People, you know, it's it's interesting, it's exciting. You can go abroad, you know, you can create global companies. The whole unicorn thing hanging above your head. Yes, I would absolutely agree with this. You know, they call me like error when I was. <laughs> When I was 20 and I came to someone that I want to make uh, some company, they called me error. I, I mean, all the doors, they were shut really behind me, in, in front of me. When I wanted to go somewhere and to, to, some, to some meeting, let's say, even with the airlines. When I, was, when I was 20, I knocked on the doors of the Austrian airlines. Here they were sitting in the parking hotel. And, and, and the guy there, I, I remember that, that look. And he was pushed to meet me because someone told him that you have to meet her because she's really clever. She, she's going to make a lot of money for you. And, and when he saw me, he was like, what the hell are you doing in my office? That was the look he gave me. What the hell? Go away, go away. Just, just go away. And uh, yes, it changes a lot because the doors are now open from, from every side. If you look for the, for the young people, they want to make the business. It's, it, it changes. And, but also the thinking of the, of the young people, yes? They, they are much more, uh, uh, much more willing to invest their time into the business. They are not just, okay, I'm going to have a good time on my, hi- uh, on my university and I'm going to study. And, you know, they, they really want, want much more. So it changes. It changes uh, from the... Uh, from the uh, so the money are coming, the people are opening the door for the young people, and yes, you have so much more opportunities. And also the way the young people are thinking changed a lot. So how has Bratislava changed? Because I've I've been in here, I've been in Bratislava for two and a half years now, and I would claim that the city, even in that short time, has has seen quite a bit of change. It's become quite hipster. It's very cool <laughs> to go out here now. You get fancy coffee and avocado toast everywhere. Yes, uh, this this Maggio Plash, it wasn't here for, uh, I don't know, when, when, when it started, but uh, 2004 definitely was not here. So yes, Bratislava changes a lot, and I like the change, I have to say. 
because, uh, as you said, there is a lot of nice new coffees. There is a lot of places for the people they can meet. Uh, it's not just the pubs and the bars and the discos, discos. It's really very nice places. Also, there's a lot of nice restaurants where you can eat. So I really like the change. And uh, also, I think, uh, and I like these changes, which is slowly but happening, these uh, bicycle roads and, and all this stuff. It's, it's really, I love it. I completely agree. I, I think it's it's fantastic. But my favorite part of it is that it brings in, and I feel it's made Slovakia and Bratislava specifically, more open to internationals. And I feel as time progresses, we're seeing more and more foreigners come in. I guess it diversifies the workforce and access to talent as well. And how have you seen that? Is it easier or harder to get uh, good talent in now? I think it's much difficult to find a good talent now, yes especially here in Bratislava, because uh, there is a lot of foreign companies. And as I said, we are funding uh, by, our, by our money. We do not really have the investors. So we really have to be careful uh, how much money we really can invest into the people. And we are trying as much as we can do. But it's, uh, it's getting much more difficult to find, uh, to find the good people here. So, for example, we have to make a really tough decision and we open a call center in Zvolen. Uh, in the central Slovakia, because it was really difficult to find the people, good people here in uh, in Bratislava already. It's really big, big competition, and it's a lot of lot of companies. And yes, as you said, maybe there's a huge diversity of people coming in, t in, but uh, still there is a lot of people going out. You know, because young people they want to have their experiences, so so they go out. They want to try something abroad, and maybe then they then come back, and then it's quite difficult because when you go abroad, you have even different opportunities. So, but of course, there are still some. They stay. There are many of them. They stay, and and they they are different. People are right now much different than they were ten or thirteen years ago. In They're a looking good or bad way. I wouldn't say it's a good or a bad way. I think they are just different because they are looking. Uh, well, the work for them means uh, something totally different different than it used to. They want to have much more fun. Before, they were not thinking about really having fun in the office. And uh, they want a nice office before. OK, they wanted a nice office, but it's so different right now. So I wouldn't say it's a bad way. I think it always brings something new. But for the employers, they have to change. You know, they have to change. I have to change my mind. It's, it's not that easy. Because if you start your business now, you have some, uh, some level in your mind. But in five years, or maybe in two years, you will have to change it. Because the, it changes everything so fast. So, yeah, I mean, so good way, good way. Yeah, I mean, we have a, I was going to say a room. It's, we have a big trailer filled with very uh, innovative and smart young people here. What would you say, why, what is Pelican doing to attract the talent that it needs? Well, we're not really doing much, I have to say again. Uh, but again, it, it's, it's connected with that, that we actually realized like really two and a half years ago that we need smart and more senior people. And uh, it's not that easy to find them. And even if you start to look for them, it takes time to find one. And then you need time to spend with that person. You cannot really hire five or ten senior people at once. Because it's me and Patrick who set up the company. And it was, it was us who were setting up the, the levels. And we have to spend the time with that smart people. We have to give them everything we know about the company and everything we want them to understand about the company. So we cannot really hire five or ten people and to see them, you know, like... Uh, uh, like, for example, people in a call center, when you have a trainer and he explains to them everything, you cannot, you cannot really train senior people like that. You really have to spend the time with them, and then you have to give them the time to think about it. They have to come back to you. You have to prepare for them uh, much much more than, than, than for the junior people. So... Uh, so we're really trying to do it. Like for example, we we just hired an HR manager in February, and uh, she is now trying to do some changes uh, in the structure, which are really really important. And once we are ready, we can really start, uh, um, let's say, uh, some some website uh, and then attracting the people because right now we can find them. And uh, one by one, we are slowly trying to bring them into the process. But, but we have to create the, uh, the network in the company, and then we can really start to uh, big promotion that we need more and more, because we will be ready for that more and more senior people. So clearly, personality fit is uh, one of the most important things you look for. You need to 
click with the people you hire? Well, I mean, I mean, everyone. I mean, every manager and every leader. If you have around you a senior people, you definitely need someone you understand to each other, and the chemistry works. Because if it doesn't, it will never bring fruit. <laughs> Fair. So, what does the future hold now? I mean, you've been in Pelican for 13 years. Yes. You probably have some good years ahead of you. Hopefully, yes. Yeah? Uh -huh. <laughs> so, what are your plans? Well, uh, my plans with the company. Well, I definitely would like to see a lot of good and smart people who are going to create the future of the company. Okay. I don't really want to be the one who is going to do that. So... Uh, I mean, for me, now the most important thing which I see is to uh, to really prepare the platform for them so they can move the company forward and forward. It's I really don't want to be the one who is going to do that because I think it's so many smart and, and, and clever people on the market right now who really are looking maybe for these kind of opportunities, but we need to make sure that we are ready for them to, to let, them, let them grow and, and, and do it. So I'm really trying to prepare the, the field for them. So, being a, I'm not going to, you're not in tech necessarily, but you have been working through the internet era, and uh, this is a touchy subject for many, but uh, being a woman in this industry, and especially in the entrepreneurial industry, what are some of the challenges that you've faced? Okay, if you are asking me how do men treat me in the business? <laughs> Not necessarily. <laughs> More about, has there been any disparity or any differences that you've seen that have been quite clear? Well, okay. So, um, first of all, I would say that uh, if the women want to, m if, if, if they want to make a business or they want to jump into the business, they will. That's first thing which I want to say. Then second thing, uh, being a woman in the business, I mean, it has advantages and disadvantages. Advantages definitely, if you are a woman, you come for a meeting and you open a mouth and you are, let's say, pretty and you are clever, then, then you of course can make men to listen to you much faster, sometimes. But sometimes it is a disadvantage because uh, men usually underestimate women and uh, sometimes they uh, they think about the women that uh, they are bunch of, they are um, they are um, they are uh, muscles or they're, they're not muscles they're, they're a bunch of emotions and they really uh, put uh, in first uh, emotions which is uh, which is not right and uh, to this topic I always also have to say that uh, I think if the men and women can uh, understand the, their differences uh, they can really make a great team. Because I think that uh, men has some advantages, but the women has also. And maybe sometimes uh, the emotions uh, which women bring into the business are good also for the people who are following these women. Because they can feel much, uh, much easier uh, the happiness and the sadness. And uh, I think they can uh, much faster understand the, the manager or the leader. So I think if the men and women can really work together, and then I think it's the best team that could ever be. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Uh, statistically, startups with, uh, with not just one gender in them do a lot better. Uh, statistics don't lie in this regard, and to throw in some, some other fun uh, figures in there as well, uh, startups with female CEOs statistically today get much more funding, more often and more, than, uh, and male why? CEOs. Does the statistics say why? Uh, that I cannot uh, pinpoint. I can uh, I can theorize, of course, to uh, to why this happens. Uh, but I think it's it's also because a lot of what has happened in the last few years is uh, the feminist movement has, in very much very many ways, caught up with society. And I mean, I'm a, I'm a self-proclaimed feminist, uh, which I find often fun being in Slovakia because, uh, as we spoke about it before. The interpretation of, of feminism varies to a large degree from culture to culture. And in many ways, when I say it in Slovakia, the interpretation of it is quite extreme. Whereas I'm from the Nordics myself, it's, it's very much more everyday language. Uh, but the concept of, uh, of egalitarianism 
in everyday life shouldn't be something we're strangers to, uh, but yet still something that is still quite prevalent. Well, I, I, I don't know why, but uh, still I think that women in Slovakia, you know, I would say they uh, they probably like much more to be uh, to be treated by men like uh, really uh, they want the men to be the one who is inviting them for the restaurant. They do not want. They don't really want to play the feminist. And yes, this feminist maybe here in Slovakia is the word which uh, you don't use quite often, and you don't want to use it because it's like <gasps> feminist. Yes, but I think that uh, you know the women. Women they, they they don't need to be the feminist to be successful in the business uh, at all. I think they can still be women. And uh, and again, as I said already, uh, this this feminism may be what we see in the United States, and, and it, it's it's really it's 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 here or, or down there. Whoever says whatever says, but uh, the feminism is uh, something that uh, yes, I agree that it's different in every country, but uh, here I I don't know why uh, the women do not really feel like uh, I need to be feminist to be successful. I need to you know, show up myself and I'm, I'm really strong and I'm gonna push all the men down and I'm stronger than the men. I think it's not important and it's not necessary for being successful. No, like, differentiating it from, uh, from extremism is, is, of course, very, very important. Uh, but again, it's, you do see some degree of, uh, of discrimination still happening in, in Slovakia. Um, yeah. <laughs> Feel um, free to disagree with me. I, I don't know. It's really what I, what I told you before. I think that the women, if they, if they, okay, discrimination. Yes, we can talk about the wages and the salaries. Of course, that's one side of it. Yes, that's like that. But I mean, yes, it's always you know that's that's always just something that uh, women. First of all, I think they want to be the mothers. I think it's like that. They want to. And maybe, okay, maybe some of them, they have a different calling, but I think the most of the women, they want to be the mothers, first of all. And I think that's the most important thing for them. And I think they are happy. And, and usually, and I think still here in Slovakia, it's uh, man is the one who is the, I don't want to say the head of the family, because it's, it's not really the head of the family, but the, the man is the one who is, uh, who, is, who, is, who is provider. Yes, exactly. So I think that's why. And I don't think that, um, that the women usually are... Uh, trying to change it. I mean, they're, I, they're, they're I, happy with that. I, I agree with your, uh, your perspective on how it is. We, uh, we disagree a bit on, uh, on, the, on the basis of it, uh, which I, I find quite interesting, because uh, I would say there is, to some degree, equal opportunity, but there is a differentiation. Like you said, m perhaps many women here see themselves as becoming mothers, and I think that's a very interesting difference. Yeah, but I mean, I agree with you that the opportunity is the same for everyone. I mean, I came from the small village. My, my parents, no one was an uh, entrepreneur, no one was in the business. Even my grandpa, like no one from my family. And I'm the woman and I'm where I am right now with the business and no one was pushing me, yes? So I think the opportunity is for everyone the same. It's just like how much you want and how hard you are willing to work. I think that's it. So... Never mind whether you are a woman or you are a man, it really is about that. You work hard and you want it, so then you can achieve it. I, I really love what you said, uh, said earlier, which is uh, as long as you're doing what you love and you're happy with what you're doing, it really doesn't matter what it is, because at the end of the day, if you're doing something that makes you unhappy, you're, you're probably in the wrong place. Of course. And I think this is amazing with you, because... You love Pelican. I love the job I'm doing. I mean, probably if it would be anywhere else, I, I would love it. It's, uh, I like to work with the people. I like to motivate the people. I like discussing their problems with them. I like to uh, help them to organize their work and maybe to, to make it much more efficient. And, and that's, that's what I like to do. I'm much more that kind of process person and, and discuss person than, than you know, Having a big ideas and, and and being a visioner that's that's not who I am. I'm I'm really much more that uh, that lever to work with the people and that's what I love and I think I would love it everywhere else. I mean it doesn't really need to be the pelican. Right now it is pelican. I'm happy there. Fantastic, Tanya. Thank you very much. Thank you guys. Give yourself a round of applause. 
I'm now going to jump into Slido because I see the board has been uh, going to town here while I've been talking, which is always nice. Uh, so we'll, we'll start at the top and then we'll, uh, we'll go down. I think, yeah, we, we sort of delved in the, into this a little bit, but we can uh, take it again because I, I really love this topic. Uh, what are the biggest struggles involved in being a female chief executive and how do you cope? So, as I said, it really, really depends. I mean, I never had a problem to uh, to somehow be the authority for the for the people in the company. And again, I think it really depends on uh, how you build your authority, for example, in the company or among the people. If you want to build it just uh, by uh, showing the business card, I'm a CEO of the company, it never is going to work. If you are promoted as a manager just because someone promoted you and you cannot really prove to uh, your, uh, your employee uh, who are working for you that uh, you are a good boss, you can really help them when they struggle, then, uh, then you will never be a good, uh, good, uh, good chief. Uh, and, and I think that really, really depends on, on, on this position. So I, I would say the struggles, I, I never said that I would really have the struggles. I had the struggles when I was young. And I think I would have the same struggles even if I would be a boy that time. Because uh, the, uh, the society was not ready for, for this kind of people. So I wouldn't really say that I would be struggling, honestly, as a female chief. I, I think I always found a way how to... Okay, maybe it was sometimes difficult with some uh, men, but it's, I, ha I have a feeling that sometimes it is much more difficult with the women, actually, in the business when I'm women, women not, not with the men. I mean, I, I have also now I have the experience, uh, I wouldn't name the, the big company. We went there for a meeting. Actually, we have a great relationship with the CEO, but there is a, there is a lady who is a manager and, and she was really tough and, and, and bad. I mean, with the CEO, we had no problem to discuss this woman she was and then there was another guy we were discussing and it was so easy and then there was a woman and I don't know it was like so difficult to talk to her because I don't know all right uh, second one here why did you make Martin Horvath CEO in 2011 well um, Martin Horvath was a was a great employee he was really, really doing very well. He started with us uh, as an agent on a call center. He was selling air tickets. Then we made him um, sales manager for uh, Czech Republic. And actually, he was the one who really did something in the Czech market for us. So we were very, very happy. And he was doing very well. So we made him marketing manager. And then, actually, we made him sales and marketing manager for all countries. That time, we had uh, Czech Republic, Hungary, and uh, Slovakia. And he was doing really very well, and he loved the job. We saw it. And then, one day, he came to me, and he asked me if I can go for a walk with him because I had a dog, he had a dog. And I was, like, wondering, he's going to talk about something really serious to me. And so we were walking with the dogs, and he told me that, look, Tanya, I mean, you know, I really would like to move somewhere more up in the organization structure. And, you know, there is only the CEO position. <laughs> and I was like, okay, fine. I mean, he's a clever boy. He's really having a very good result. And uh, he either leaves when I tell him, I'm not going to give it to you because you're not ready, or he is going to be a great CEO, or he's going to really uh, fuck it up, <laughs> I have to say. So what was my option? I was like, okay, I'm going to try. So that's why we gave Martin this position. And uh, I was very sorry I gave it to him because he was just not ready for that position. I mean, the position CEO is really, really very difficult when it comes to some problems in the company. And you have to stand strongly on your feet, on the earth, I mean, on the ground. Because if you don't, then the first big problem is going to, you know, like you push you to do some more mistakes and the other mistake and the other mistake because you cannot really look into the mirror and face the, face the problem you have in front of your nose. And unfortunately, this happened with Martin. So I was, I was very sorry to do it because I have to admit that uh, 
that uh, it was it was it was really really difficult for me, and it was very. I, and I was that then I was really very tough on him because he did it with quite a nasty way. How he how he tried to leave the company when it was in the big sheets and. Uh, and I really had another project going on where I was spending 14 hours a day and I was really tired and, and it was just starting and I just couldn't imagine how to return back to that uh, to that Pelican because he was just giving up and he didn't want to fight. So he was not ready for the position. Yeah, it's, many people think that this being a CEO is I just, the... I just want to say at, at, at the end, it was my mistake. It was not his mistake. It was purely my mistake. For example, if you were asking about Miska, this was one big mistake I made, and I'm really sorry that sorry for that because, I mean, it's we, we had to end up the relationship like like this. So before we were really good friends. Now we don't t talk much to each other because, so. But that was a big mistake. Yeah, like I was saying, many people think that being a CEO is the pinnacle of your professional career and kind of the highest thing you can achieve, but. From what I know, I've, I've never been a CEO myself. Uh, and I'm not sure I would actually ever be interested in being a CEO because what you'd handle and what you do as a CEO, especially of, of a smaller company, it's, I don't think it is the job description is what people think because you don't get to be so much involved in the fun parts of the company. You have to have very much a bird's eye view and you deal with a different type of people. You know what I have to say? I was once at the uh, Comenius University at the management faculty. There was this big audience, like all the students, and they have uh, different questions which uh, they were asking me. And one of the questions was, you know, there might be some uh, economical downturn and uh, what do you think? When is the best time to start the business? I was like, the best time to start a business is when you want to start a business, never mind whether there's an economic crisis or is not. And if you are a little bit scared, just a little bit scared, don't start any business. Because, I mean, this little scared thing is the thing that comes when it comes the first problem, and then you just give up. So, and you lose everything you started. So if you are just a little bit afraid, and if you are not really like, I'm gonna do it and I'm gonna make it, whatever happens, just don't even start. So that's what I'm that's what I'm saying all the time. Fair enough. All right. Who's your biggest competitor from your point of view? Um, depends on the countries where we are. So there are some countries where, uh, like in Slovakia, I can say that our biggest competitors are the airlines. Okay. Even if we are providing uh, totally different services, the airlines think that we as an OTA and a very strong one here, we are a competitor for them. I think we are not, but okay, so we have to behave like their competitor. And uh, in the other countries, uh, OTAs like us, the same ones, they are doing what, what we are trying to do, just every one of us is trying to do it somehow different and somehow better. Yeah, because... I'll be honest, I had never heard of Pelican until I came to Slovakia. Granted, I'd, I'd never lived in any of the countries which you're present in, so, you know, I, I must be forgiven at least a little bit. Uh, and, and for me, being abroad and traveling, it's, it's, it's usually, I believe, Skyscanner is the, uh, is the big one. Uh, how do you deal with competition that's so global in reach? Well, we're doing some things uh, quite differently. And uh, first of all, I think we really have a good customer service. I'm happy for that brave people, some of them sitting up there. And uh, because it's really difficult business, uh, it's, uh, it's really difficult the job, yes, to, to provide this, this service for the, for the clients. And we're really, really working hard to make it even better. I think it's very important because, uh, okay, fine, you can go to Skyscanner, but uh, then when it comes some problem, you have someone else not to Skyscanner to deal with, yes? Yeah. And then, okay, uh, we have a lot of clients, they uh, come to our site, they search, and then they go and buy somewhere else directly with the airline. But then when they have a problem, they call us. Yes, because they, they just don't know how to deal with the problem. Like, let's say you have to deal with some problem with, uh, with some airline which has a call center. This call center, first of all, is not, your local, not in your local language. Okay, fine, you all speak perfect, uh, perfect English. But still, there are people who are not uh, sometimes well experienced and... Uh, it takes you ages to solve some problem. But with us, you can reach us very fast. And we are really trying to solve the problem for the clients. 
And also on the website, I have to say that uh, you find everything like these days. If you go to Ryanair or Wizair until you finish uh, the booking, you end up with several different services which you have to buy or it's so difficult and you really have to be careful so you don't add some other services. With us, you have one easy process. Any airline you have, you still have one easy process. You know exactly where you are and you don't have to go on each side. It takes you much less than when you do the booking on Ryanair. I'm impressed. I mean, I've never been a big fan of Skyscanner, so uh, you've convinced me I'm going to try Pelican next. Uh, I'll give it a go, I'll give it a go. I'll give feedback at the next startup grind, don't you worry. I'm actually, I'm a really terrible sales, I have to say. <laughs> um, let's keep jumping. Uh, I think you already answered this one. What was your biggest mistake at Pelican? I believe that was kind of so linked. I, I have to say we made some, some more mistakes, but I'm, I'm always so much sorry when we make a mistake with the, with the people. It, it hurts the most, I have to say. And this one with Martin, it really hurt me. I mean, it was, it was really difficult. I was, I was angry, I was upset, I was everything. I had a difficult time that, yeah, so it was, it was really a big mistake. And the other one, uh, which I can say from the business point of view, which I can say uh, we, we made, uh, we were not ready for starting the packages, and we started a new brand for the packages. Describe, that, I don't understand what you mean by packages. We started a new brand, which was called Chimpo. It was Martin's project, which didn't break out, actually, one of them. And we wanted him to try. And uh, that, was the, that was the brand for the, for the packages and for the tours. And we tried to do it and promote it as a chimpa, but, uh, but it didn't work out and we lost of money. Fair enough. There's uh, quite a hip-hop party going on here. So, guys, I think we'll uh, wrap it up with that. Tanya, thank you You're welcome. very, you. very much. And thank you guys for being a wonderful audience. Now go dance and have a good time. Thank you. Thank you.